The taconite that was cited actually is a magnetic iron ore, which has a lot of magnetite in it, but, but it basically uh, is very low in iron content, so we have to do some processing to concentrate that iron. And they use the magnetic properties of the material to actually extract it. So you saw some big magnets there that were turning uh, in that film. That was actually to pull out the magnetic components or that iron ore that uh, was then concentrated at the uh, plants up in Minnesota for U.S. Steel. So that's that taconite. You can see 20 to 25 percent iron versus 70 percent iron. So a lot of differences uh, in terms of what's extractable, what's commercial. And there's some other iron forms below that. There's different types of mining. Uh, when your iron ore uh, deposit is close to the surface, you can remove the top surface and you can get right at your iron ore. That's called open pit mining. And we do that uh, at most places around the world, including in the U.S., <coughs> in Michigan, and in Minnesota. Uh, we had an uh, iron ore mine in Missouri that was an underground mine, and you had to actually go in and, and form shafts to get at the iron and ore. And it can be very, very soft and easily deformed, which you might want if you're going to make a crazy d difficult part out of it that you need a lot of drawing capabilities. Or you might need it to be super, super strong as you buy it because you don't want it to bend and form and, and break. Right? So these are all things that would be considered, but a compound, you get what you get and it has its properties. It's not really changeable or definable and it's not engineerable. So the power of the alloy is what we're going to focus on. Because at the point that we're talking about when somebody buys steel, to me, what I like to relate to folks is that they're not buying steel so much as that they're buying a specific characteristic or list of properties. The properties of how that steel is going to uh, bend, form, break, how strong it is, all of these things are really, really what we're focusing on. But we can get the properties with different things from the steel mill's perspective, the things that we're going to be concerned about from a raw material perspective and how we process it and how much cost goes into it has everything to do with the chemistry, what we're actually talking about in terms of elements, how much carbon, that kind of thing, the structure and how those atoms are re related to each other. And I'll show you a little bit of that later. That's the Metallurgy 101, understanding on a microscopic actually atomic level what's happening as you tinker toy these things together and create a structure that you can hold in your hand. And that is also controlled through the processing methods that the steel mill uses, what temperatures they use. Here's, how much we're, I'm going to try to move into what we'll call markets. But in, in the nature of a very diverse industry like steel, there's a lot of definitions of what a market could and should be defined as. And I would say it has a lot to do with you, the person that is approaching the steel industry and what you want to do. Do you want to sell the industry something that your company makes that they might use? Do you, do you sell uh, copy machines? Do you sell computers? That might be a different market to you than if you're studying something that steel industry makes or you're, you're going to sell something that a certain kind of steel mill uh, might use because they use electric furnaces versus the integrated steel process. So let's talk a little bit of various definitions of what a steel market might be. For example, if you think about it, there's at least 1,200 steel makers, steel companies you could call them, but they actually make steel the way Roger and Don described yesterday. They make it from some source. In the world, around the globe, pretty huge market if you were selling stationary that always starts with the word steel, let's say. Uh, but there's other aspects of the steel industry. There are downstream processors who they then take the steel as it comes out of the steel mill and they do something to it to prepare it. For I pay the 5%, it's done. Or in Canada, I can raise my prices 5% and I don't pay a thing. I, or I pay the government or I raise my prices. Done. That's it. In the US system, the only one in the world, when you bring in that product, let's say it's a 5%, and you're two years from now, the dumping order is still in place, but you had to have the steel from this particular supplier because he was a certified supplier and qualified and you needed it. So you pay the 5%. Two years later, they start an investigation. This is standard procedure. 
if the, if the domestic industry asks for it, they ask for an administrative review is the, what it's called. And the Commerce Department, in its infinite wisdom, will determine whether 5% was right. So they're going to do basically redo the whole dumping calculation inside the Commerce Department, and then they can send you a bill. Or they can send you your money back, too. They do that sometimes. So three years later, when that review is over, three years after you imported that product, you get a bill from the Commerce saying, uh, 5% wasn't enough, send us another 10. I'm not making this up. This is how it works. It's complete insanity. What's the strategy going to be? Are you going to go out on the internet? Are you going to send an RFP to service centers? Are you going to direct the mill by? Uh, there's probably 15 different ways that you can attack and go to market. How do you execute the strategy? Okay, once all the research is done and you say, okay, this is how I want to execute. Do I want to give a third to a service center, a third to a mill, a third to, uh, to the foreigners, uh, to a trader? Uh, you have to determine the financial best fit for your company. And that's where the strategic sourcing comes in. How do you do a contract? Who is responsible for administering a contract? Because today, you don't want to fly blind. You really, really need to say, okay, this is what I want to do now. Which partners am I going to use to execute the contract and we can hold to it? Because you're committing to them for something. You want them to commit back to you. And the only thing you can do that is through a written contract.